there aren't any true symptoms where you say, "Uh uh-oh, I'm about to have an aneurysm because aneurysms don't just develop rather acutely. They break acutely, meaning they pop open and rupture. And the most common symptom when an aneurysm breaks or bursts is the acute onset, sudden onset of the worst headache of one's life. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Ken Liebman. I'm an attending neurosurgeon and I'm a comprehensively trained cerebrovascular neurosurgeon, which means my specialty is treating blood vessel diseases of the spine and brain. So an aneurysm, and specifically because we're dealing with neurosurgery, a brain aneurysm is a ballooning or outpouching on the wall of an artery. So it's a weakness on the wall of an artery. There are different thought processes, one of which is that you're born with a weakness. So the arteries are made up of a bunch of layers. It's not just one single layer like paper, it's a bunch of layers. And one of the layers is actually a muscle layer. And you can actually be born with this gap or this insufficiency in the muscle layer, which weakens the artery, so the artery forms this aneurysm. Another thing that can happen is long-term changes of the artery. So if you are have high blood pressure, smoking, it causes injury to the arteries in the brain and the rest of the body. And those injury can weaken the artery. You can form an, an aneurysm that way as well. There are a lot of differences because the blood vessels in the brain are very different than the blood vessels other places in the body. There's really no support system. So when an artery weakens, there's no outside support system to help strengthen that artery. And there's no great correlation between an aneurysm in the brain, a cerebral aneurysm, versus an aneurysm somewhere else in the body, unless you have a certain type of disorder. And not to use medical jargon, but it's called a connective tissue disorder, which if you have Uh, A lot of aneurysms, other places in the brain, sometimes we test for that. And also there's certain body habituses where we say, based on the patient, what the patient looks like, their fingers, et cetera, that we say, oh, maybe they have a connective tissue disorder that we need to test them uh, a little bit more rigorously. A blood vessel event to the brain in broad category is a stroke. It can be either ischemic, meaning not enough oxygen oxygen to the brain, or it can be hemorrhagic or bleed in the brain. But it's a stroke because it's a blood vessel change to the brain. And aneurysm, there are different types of aneurysms. The more common, what we usually talk about, is what's called a saccular or berry aneurysm. The name is consistent with what it looks like. It looks like a little berry on an arterial tree. So the arteries look like trees, and this aneurysm looks like a little berry or a sac. But sometimes you can develop what are called fusiform aneurysms, and that just means the whole artery itself is widened. So the artery, is there's not just this little berry that's hanging off the side. It's the whole, the whole artery is widened. You can also have, with that, going into great detail, what are called dissecting aneurysms. So, but the ones we usually talk about with patients, with families, is what's called this, the berry or saccular aneurysm. There aren't any true symptoms where you say, "Uh uh-oh, I'm about to have an aneurysm, because aneurysms don't just develop rather acutely. They break acutely, meaning they pop open and rupture. And the most common symptom when an aneurysm breaks or bursts is the acute onset, sudden onset of the worst headache of one's life, sudden onset thunderclap headache. That's when we, as doctors, In the ER, neurosurgery, irrespective of your specialty, when you hear that, you think, okay, the patient needs to be assessed because that sounds like a bleed, an aneurysmal bleed. Um, There are other symptoms that aneurysms can cause, but that's the most common and the most devastating symptom. Other symptoms in aneurysm can grow and it can put pressure on the surrounding structures. So if it's pressing on a nerve, you can get weird symptoms. It can cause seizures when it gets really big. Uh, it can, If there's a little blood clot that forms in the aneurysm, it can cause stroke. But the most common and devastating symptom is that of the acute onset or sudden onset of a 
uh, worst headache of one's life. Well, the first thing we do is we decide whether treatment is indicated because not everybody who has an aneurysm warrants treatment. The size of the aneurysm, the shape of the aneurysm, there are certain things we look for, a family history, a history of uh, other problems patients may have that increase the risk of it popping, such as smoking, high blood pressure, again, family history. So the first thing we do is we do the appropriate vetting. We determine whether or not it needs to be treated and location is important. Then once treatment is necessary, one of the things that I think is unique about GNI is that we take a very comprehensive approach. We are a team. So that is important if treatment is, to be, is indicated, who's gonna be involved in the treatment? The neurosurgeon, the nurses, the techs, where you are after treatment, and then the follow-up care. It's a very comprehensive, cohesive team. And I think that is unique and separates us from other types of quote-unquote institutes. We are truly an institute made up of neurology, neurosurgery, advanced practitioners, nursing, et cetera. And we work together in a, just a wonderful, uh, comprehensive team. And then when if, if one does have an aneurysm, they're going to see someone like me and my five partners who are comprehensively trained neurosurgeons. So that means we offer every treatment that is indicated or not indicated. So we come up with an algorithm, a treatment algorithm that is perfect for the patient, not for the doctor, but for the patient because we have all the capabilities to do that treatment. Whether it's going through the groin, up into the aneurysm and putting whatever it is we need to put in to block it off or making an incision on the head and putting a clip across it or a combination of the above. That is right now in terms of our, because of our advancements, both in our technical skills as well as the equipment we're using, the more common way to approach is through the groin so or through the wrist the groin or through the wrist, going in the artery through the, uh, through the wrist, up the arm, or in the groin, up through the body, all inside the artery with small little catheters, we're able to go all the way up in the distal blood vessels in the brain and treat aneurysms, either putting stuff inside the aneurysm to block it or putting a stent or a structure in the artery that bypasses, so the blood bypasses the aneurysm and just continues along the normal path and clots the aneurysm off or a combination of the above. So yeah, we, we can, that is the more common approach because it's less invasive with better outcomes. You know, it's a great question because psychologically it's, overwhelming. There's not too many people that have not heard the word aneurysm. And if they think of, and you hear about a brain aneurysm, and there are books written about brain aneurysm, the time bomb in my head. So even if it's, because size is important when it comes to aneurysms and treatments and whether it's changed in size and shape. But the point is, a person comes to you with an aneurysm, they don't, they don't know what the size means, meaning it's one millimeter versus 10 millimeters, they just know, they hear the word aneurysm. So it's psychologically overwhelming. And that's why we, and, and that's another thing that makes us different at Global Neuroscience Institute, because we understand that. The neurosurgeons here are husbands, wives, moms, sons, daughters. The point is we, we understand that everybody's, patients should be treated like our families. and. If our family came to us with the diagnosis of an aneurysm, we would make sure that we got that person to the right neurosurgeon right away without a delay so that we could say to them, nothing to worry about. You are going to live long and prosper and live your life. Or, you know what, we should probably be a little bit more aggressive and treat, and treat this with the right. And when you leave, if we think treatment is appropriate, you will have a date and where we're going to get things going. So it's not, you're not in this limbo state of, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to me? Aneurysms, it depends on what type, because we talked about the way one develops an aneurysm. So the 
what are called angiopathic changes, so that's non-using medical terms, the changes that occur from high blood pressure and smoking can form aneurysms. So the way to prevent that is controlled blood pressure. One of the more, it's called the silent killer, high blood pressure, because we don't always know when an aneurysm forms and if it's gonna break, causing a bleed in one's brain. So blood pressure control, avoid smoking. Smoking also increases the risk of rupture. So those are the things that you can do to prevent them from forming from the changes that occur in the artery. If there's a family history or you have what's called a saccular aneurysm, there's no way to prevent it from forming, but to prevent it from getting larger, it, one of the ways to reduce the risk is smoking and blood pressure control. 